a little bit about vitamin K2 in, uh, in a minute. Um, but one of the really interesting advances in nutrition and biochemical science is the area of cell signaling. So going back to our original question, whether uh, how plants communicate with us or rather with our DNA, um, this is something that USANA has been looking at this is, uh, for quite a few years now. It's been one of the major focuses of their work to look at many plant chemicals and how they interact with our cells and with our DNA. So now we're getting into the realms of intelligent cells and we can, we can see that intelligence is not dependent on a brain. There is intelligence within every single cell and there are quadrillions of reactions going on, each driven, or a lot of them driven by enzymes uh, and proteins. And this is just a tiny part, this diagram is just a tiny part of those quadrillions of reactions. And all these reactions are, are um, based on our genetic material, so on our genes. You may remember from your biology lessons, the, what we're taught about our DNA is that it dictates everything dictates our character, our looks, how tall you grow, your health, whether you're going to get cancer or heart disease. And to some extent, this is true. But there is a whole new science out there called epigenetics. And Dr. Bruce Lipton, if you've come across any of his books, he wrote a book called The Biology of Belief. And he talks about genes being switched on or off or suppressed and genes are actually um, influenced by nutrients and thoughts and emotions and by stress and pollutants and also by fasting and calorie restriction or even to a greater extent starvation so dna is actually a responsive molecule and it's it's not it is dictating uh, our health and and uh, how we uh, exist, but it itself is dictated too, so it's responding to its environment. And here we can see a small, a um, more concentrated version or just a, a little snapshot of that big cell signaling picture. And we've got a cell here, the, the top of the cell, the, the top layer of this diagram here is the cell membrane. And in the middle of the cell membrane, you've got a receptor. And this receptor is receiving signaling molecules. So all kinds of molecules like uh, hormones and cytokines and uh, stress chemicals. You've got glucose coming in. You've got um, drugs, um, any kind of signal that is being put into the body is taken up by this receptor or by various receptors in the cell membrane and then passed through the cell membrane to proteins waiting inside the cell to cause cascades of reactions um, and to pass messages on from one protein to the next in order to affect a, a big reaction at the end in the cell so that the cell can do a particular job. So we've got these proteins working inside the cell, but what's directing the proteins or the workers? Well, it's a huge network of messages vast cellular networks that are switching things on and off and allowing things to pass through or not to pass through. So this is quite a nice analogy, I think, with, with uh, trains and, and signaling. And here's a simplified version of what we saw earlier. So you've got your 
receptor on the outside in, in the cell membrane, and it's passing messages between the receptor um, from protein to protein in a process called trans transduction, ending up in a response in the cell. So these receptors have been around since the beginning of time and since the beginning of evolution. And some of them emerged around 1.2 billion years ago, particularly the, the sense receptors, so the taste and smell, for example. Um, we've got bitter taste receptors that that are sensitive to bitter herbs, for example. Um, these are found not only on the tongue, but also in the colon, in the large intestine and in the lungs. It's quite strange to have taste receptors in these places where we, we, we don't taste things, but they are sensing bitter, those bitter molecules and the ones in the gut when they sense a bitter molecule, they release ghrelin, which is a hormone, it's known as the hunger hormone. And in the lungs, when one of these receptors in the lungs senses one of these molecules, it causes bronchodilation, which is the expansion of the airways. And others, other receptors, other kinds of receptors have emerged later on in our evolution alongside the plants that we have been eating and the, the environment that we've been exposed to. And we'll, we'll go into those a little bit later on. We've also got hormones acting as signaling molecules and gases. So nitric oxide is one of these gases that, uh, nitric oxide is actually a free radical but it has quite profound effects in the body and we do need some free radicals. Uh, it acts as an anabolic stimulus, so it increases lean body mass. And it's a molecule that's found in the inner layer of our blood vessels. And it's a messenger molecule that transmits signals to cells in various parts of the body, like the cardiovascular system and the nervous system and the immune system. And once it's released through exercise, it actually makes the blood vessel walls relax. So in that way, it helps to lower blood pressure. It's also involved in the sweeping action of these cilia that you can see there in the lungs, in, in the airways in the lungs, helping to push mucus out of the body. And we've also got signaling going on in the gut. So zonulin is an enzyme that opens up the little gaps. There are little gaps between all the cells in the gut lining. And these gaps, we don't want them to be too big because we don't want undigested proteins, for example, to pass through into the bloodstream from the gut. So these these gaps called tight junctions are usually pretty tight. Um, but zonulin opens these, gut, these gaps up. Um, and what causes zonulin to open these gaps up is in a, one of the things that causes this to happen is gluten, which is found in, in wheat. This has a profound effect on somebody with celiac disease, but it actually has the same effect in everybody. Each, every human being will, will do this if they eat gluten. And for many of us, or most of us, it's not a problem. But you will have you've maybe heard the term leaky gut. So if you have a leaky gut, the best thing you can do for that is to stop eating gluten for a while until your gut heals itself. Other things in the diet that can do this and open these gaps up are black and green pepper. There's a, a, a 
compound in there called piperine, which has the same effect as gluten and bay leaf extract and also black tea and alcohol and nutmeg, they all, they all do that. Now, vitamin K2 is also a signaling molecule and it works like a hormone. You may have been prescribed, um, you may have been prescribed calcium by your doctor if you're worried about osteoporosis or your bone density. Doctor will often prescribe calcium along with a little bit of vitamin D because they know that vitamin D helps with absorption of calcium. But what many doctors don't know, because they really don't have time to read the research on this, and there is the, the research on vitamin K2 is only just emerging. As I said earlier, there's just under 4,000 papers out there at the moment on vitamin K2. So your, your doctor will not have told you that you need to take K2 in order to tell the calcium where to go. Not in a rude way, of course, but yeah, when you, when you get calcium being absorbed into your blood, you want the calcium to go into your bones. If vitamin K2 isn't there, and it's very actually very difficult to get it in our diet because the the best source is natto which is a fermented soya bean which is eaten in japan but other than that very few food sources have enough vitamin k2 to to suffice to to do this job um and k2 tells the calcium to go into the bones and not into the soft tissues where we don't want it to be and not into the blood vessels where it can cause or contribute to heart disease. So food as information, the nutrients from a good healthy diet send the right information to the cells to keep them functioning as, as they are meant to do. And multitudes of signals are sent around the body by different nutrients every time we eat. For example, we've got all the um, vitamins. Vitamin A, which is also known as retinol, goes to the eyes via receptors on the outsides of cells and causes a cascade of, of proteins. Vitamin D also acts as a hormone and it has many signaling fu functions. For example, in cancer, so it prevents cells from multiplying and it prevents blood vessels from being created to supply tumors. And it's also involved in pathways to do with mineral absorption, as we've just heard with the K2 story and the immune system. Magnesium, for example, has a role in the immune system, as does calcium. And uh, calcium also has a role in the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system and in fact nearly every aspect of cellular life calcium is hugely important and phytonutrients so as we've heard earlier phytonutrients are these chemicals that are found in plants and they have profound effects on our cells so we've got on the top left hand corner we've got basil which is high in carotenoids. So you've got zeaxanthin and lutein and vitamin A, which are all really helpful for our eyes. And they protect the retina from oxidative damage. They reduce the risk of developing macular degeneration. And if you've, if you've got sufficient amounts, you can reduce your risk by up to 43%. On the right-hand side, we've got the very pretty cannabis leaf. And we have cannabis cannabinoid receptors all over our body, which have evolved with us as we would have uh, in Paleolithic times. And before, before that, we would have eaten a lot of hemp in our diet. Then we've got rosemary on the bottom left hand corner. Lots of research on anti-cancer anti properties of rosemary. Now we've got a different kind of information 
from coming from food. It's uh, the kind of information that causes overload in every in every uh, respect. So it's confusing the body. It's sending bad information with with bad effects that cause malfunction in the cells, which then leads to disease and eventually death. And we we want the right kind of information to be going to our cells to maximize the effectiveness of our cells and to optimize our health and prolong our life. So we can call this kind of information or you, our use of this kind of information biohacking, which is taking, taking the knowledge about plants and about the nutrients in plants to optimize health. And what the scientists have found is that signaling, these tiny signals can be amplified. So hormesis is about putting a tiny stress into the body to have a, a huge, a massive impact. And we can see just from this little video here, how that, in, how that concept works. Boom. So we know, um, or the, the scientists, um, in particular the scientists at USANA and in research institutes and universities around the world, um, they know what nutrients can, can have these effects and they know um, what combinations of nutrients are the most powerful and how much of a certain nutrient uh, to put into a formula. But science is changing all the time. And the pre what people what scientists used to think, um, and this is how most anti antioxidant vitamins will work, uh, the vitamins that you buy in the shops. Um, the thinking has always been to put the put um, the vitamins a, C, E, into the body to quench free radicals. Um, but now the new way of thinking is all about creating healthy cells so that they can do the job that they need to do. And the cells um, create or, or produce their own antioxidants. So endogenous antioxidants means antioxidants that are produced inside the body by our own cells. So we have to create healthy cells which can then turn on the right genes. So here's the old paradigm. One free radical is quenched by one molecule of vitamin A or vit vitamin C or vitamin E. And here's the new paradigm. So we are putting in a phytonutrient, for example, that is then quenching a hundred or more free radicals, so much more powerful because the antioxidants in our body that we make ourselves are far more pow powerful than the ones we put in. And um, so the cells, our cells are responsive to the environment and they can, they, they know what's going on, they know when there are stresses around and they respond to the environment. And one of the um, one of the proteins in the body that responds is NRF2. And the, the response that it has is to turn on the, the endogenous antioxidants. So it's responding to stress and cytokines and free radicals and all these things you can see on the list there. Um, and it triggers uh, things like gl glutathione. So the antioxidants like glutathione and superoxide dismutase and it activates about 300 genes responsible for antioxidant and anti-inflammatory 
activity. So it's enormously powerful. And these are some of the plant chemicals, the phytonutrients that act on these receptors, on the same receptors that are receptive to the stress hormones and the stress signals. These also do the same thing to activate those antioxidants. So we've got quercetin, uh, that's found in lots of fruit and vegetables and it's the best source of, uh, the, um, yeah, the best sources from red onions. And it has anti-inflammatory effects that can actually kill cancer, cancer cells and control blood sugar and help prevent heart disease, all sorts of amazing effects in the body. Whereas veritrol uh, is found in grape skins and a lot of berry fruits and it inhib inhibits inflammation. And at the same time, it, um, it stops the, the, the NF kappa beta pathway, it's called, that creates infl inflammation. Uh, so it's not only stimulating the production of antioxidants, but also down-regulating inflammation. As part of the immune response, um, we do need inflammation, but it needs to be a balance. Then you've got curcumin, which is from turmeric. And ALA, uh, we should have a, an H in there, um, alpha lipoic acid. Uh, it naturally occurs in fatty, it's an, a fatty acid, which occurs in food. We found it in yeast and spinach and broccoli, organ meats like liver and kidney. And then we've got terrastilbene, which comes from a plant or a tree called Terracarpus marsupium, also known as the Indian Kino tree. And it's been used in India for thousands of years as an antibiotic and for controlling blood sugar, um, as an astringent, anti-diarrheal, anti-hemorrhagic, so so many, so many uses, um, which are amazing. And so the Induction of NRF2, which we were talking about, um, has actually been shown to protect against the risk of liver cancer, certain liver cancer um, caused by um, aflatoxin. So aflatoxin is, is a toxic um, molecule that we find, you can find in peanuts and pistachios. Um, and NRF2 is also, can also protect against certain lung tumours they found in, in the research and conditions in the lungs and, and heart that are caused by cigarette smoking. So it's an incredibly powerful um, uh, protein. So not only do phytonutrients enhance antioxidant pr protection, but they also um, activate the renewal processes in cells. And we're going to talk about that now. So back to our food as information and our mega burger. And just as a little aside here, you can see this pot of medication on the left. Um, some researchers at Imperial College London a few years ago actually suggested, seriously suggested in a paper that they wrote, um, making statins available in fast food restaurants. I hate calling them restaurants, they're hardly restaurants, but um, to offset the damage of the food that they were selling, isn't that incredible? But really with this kind of food, we're getting an information overload. So our bodies are an, every kind of overload actually, and it's an overload of bad information. So we, we're getting lots and lots of energy from these big burgers. Um, and we think of we think of energy as not being tired, and the kids bounce around the house with lots of energy, and the long suffering parents grab a biscuit to keep them going, keep them give them some energy to keep them going so they can last through until the next meal. Um, but there's more there's more to energy than just this sort of outward expression of energy, and the energy currency in the body that fuels the muscles and brain to keep us awake and moving is called ATP, which you may have heard of if you did biology, adenosine triphosphate. Um, so apart from the big mechanical tasks like moving muscles, 
ATP also powers the processes at the cellular level, like transporting molecules across the cell membrane and in and out of the cell. Um, and it's also used to create new, new DNA and lots and lots of other processes. So you can think of the, the mitochondria, which makes the ATP as a kind of factory. And there are, there are lots of en um, electrons flying around in this factory. Um, there's a, a good analogy, which um, uh, my friend David told me today about um, Think of a fire, a fireplace, and you've got sparks flying out of this fire and landing on the rug in front of the fire. And just the odd spark landing there isn't going to be a problem. But when thousands of sparks have landed on that rug, it's really going to be in a bit of a poor state and it's, it's not going to, yeah, it's not going to be a very nice rug. Um, but if you have a a fire guard there and the, there's some kind of protection then your the the rug is going to be staying intact and it's the same with the membrane of the mitochondria so all these electrons flying around are, are actually making holes in the membrane and degrading the membrane so that it's it's not effective it's not holding the mitochondria to, mitochondrion together um so eventually the mitochondria kind of shrivel up and leave bits of themselves around in the cell and make an awful mess actually. Um, so not only have you got hundreds or even thousands of inefficient mitochondria that aren't doing their job properly, uh, you've also got lots of litter around. And when the mitochondria are constantly being flooded with lots of high energy food, they become very tired and they're producing free radicals themselves. So they're contributing to oxidative sp stress. So in order for a cell to get its house in order to tidy up all this litter, it needs to gobble up the mitochondria that aren't working properly. And, and when there are plenty of supplies coming into the factory and income is being generated, let's think of, think of ATP as the, the currency of the, the energy currency, so that's the income, um, there's no time to clean up. In other words, when there's glucose coming in through our food and being transformed into ATP, the, all the factory resources are being put into building and expansion. So building muscle, putting on fat, making new cells. And it's only when the food is scarce that the signal is switched off for building and the shop floor managers decide it's time to tidy up a bit. So it's a bit like us in lockdown. In normal day-to-day -day lives, we're concentrating on going to work and earning money and, and accumulating stuff. But then on lockdown, we start to think, oh, we can clear out. And it's, uh, it's a great, great cathartic thing to do. Um, and with our cells, that is actually how our cells have worked since time immemorial until very very recently um so throughout evolution and it's still the same now with wild animals of course and with um people who live in hunter-gatherer communities um the normal way of being is feast and famine feast and famine and you spend months of waiting and in those months of waiting in times of scarcity, that's the time when you need to conserve your energy and materials. But now, uh, the, time, the way we're living now has upset the results of really two billion years of evolution and natural selection, going a lot further back than, than this, the, the chimpanzee or the, the ape at the beginning of this timeline here. So the mechanism behind this balance between growth and clearing out is down to the mTOR gene. So that's M with a, a capital M. The gene is, has a capital M and the gene codes for mTOR, uh, which is a signaling protein uh, with a small m. And so these are some of the workers in the cell. And you've got, so it, it's acting like a, a quality control officer in the factory and day by day autophagy 
should be just ticking over and the mitochondria should be lasting a few days. But when there's loads of blood sugar going into the system, too much information, too, you know, too much litter in the cells, then this process becomes inefficient and the mitochondria hang around for a lot longer than they ought to. Um, and in times of stress, we, we actually need more mitophagy to keep ourselves healthy. The signaling goes wrong if the system is overloaded. But um, So the mTOR um, protein acts as a sensor for the nutrient levels in the cell. And it can detect, it can get, detect all sorts of environmental things like levels of energy and oxygen in the cells. And it decides when the cell needs to be terminated. Um, it's a bit drastic for the factory analogy. Um, but a bit less drastic is that it decides also when the cell or the mitochondria in the cell need to be recycled. And mitophagy is the name for this recycling process. Uh, it literally means eating of the mitochondria. And mitophagy happens when mTOR is switched off, so in a period of scarcity. mTOR is activated in a period of abundance and plenty. But we are actually locked into an mTOR mode. We, we're in a kind of state of continual, continual growth. So we're, we're growing outwards and we're growing fat cells and ineffective cells, which leads to obesity and type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease and you name it, and also an increased risk of cancer. Uh, so we, we're locked into this mode. Um, which is why fasting is, is so good. So cal calorie restriction um, actually causes um, longevity and um, creates more effective cells and cleans them out, cleans out and detoxifies. So what switches mTOR off and activates autophagy and mitophagy? On the right, you can see some of the um, nutrients that, that do this. So green tea extract, um, it's uh, very helpful with some cancers, studies have shown that um, it's uh, a trigger for cell death. So programmed cell death, which we, we want to happen, that's a good thing. Um, cancer actually switches off that pro programmed cell death process, uh, which means that cells can proliferate unhindered. So we, we want cell death to happen and autophagy. Um, so green tea extract activates one of these um, sirtuins, the SIRT1 gene. Um, it's known as the long, longevity gene. There have been studies on all kinds, of every kind of organism that they've studied. So from yeasts to uh, worms to fruit fly, to mice, they found that when sirtuins are activated, these organisms, whatever it is, um, always live longer. And in, in the male mice, they found that it lived almost 16% 16 longer when these sirtuins were activated. Uh, the way they did this was by calorie restriction, um, which is which tells us that it's a, a really sensible thing to do intermittent fasting and eating in a way that activates mTOR. Um, so, uh, sorry, that deactivates mTOR. We do need to activate mTOR uh, to build muscle because mTOR stimulates growth, of course, as I said, um, but we need that balance between growth and cleaning out and cell, cellular renewal. And then another, another of these is curcumin, which is found, it's, it's actually the, in, the, in the phytonutrient rainbow, it's the yellow, of course. And apart from switching on the antioxidant pathways, as we heard before, and switching off the inflammation pathways, it also triggers the process that gets rid of damaged mitochondria. So it's a multi-purpose uh, multi 
resveratrol, uh, we spoke about that before, but they've also found that it also activates the CERT1 gene. And this can be really helpful in Parkinson's, for example, where there's a problem with misfolded pre proteins building up and mitochondria becoming dysfunctional. And then we've got olive oil as olive oil as one of the um, one of the polyphenols that activate this as well. Um, a number of this is um, a proprietary um, uh, name for a collection of polyphenols that uh, USANA have researched, um, and it comes from the water soluble bit in olives that's normally thrown away when they're making olive oil. But they found that um, that these this um, these compounds um, can help support DNA and they can help support mitochondria and other cell structures from oxidative stress because it's really powerful at neutralizing reactive uh, very reactive free radicals and the main um, compound in olive fruit or very important one is hydroxytyrosol uh, which does a huge amount of things like uh, they think it's uh, helpful in he healthy circulation and uh, healthy cholesterol levels they've also found that it helps uh, eye health uh, by pro protect, preventing oxidative stress in the retina. And there is some research on um, these compounds stimulating glutathione as well. So let's just recap very quickly. So cellular signaling pathways are like a chain of dominoes that have some terminal cellular consequence. And receptors we found are like a lock and key that coordinate cellular function. But when those messaging pathways aren't clear, the signals can get crossed, slow down or not be sent at all. And what makes these signals slow down? Just lifestyle, um, lifestyle problems like smoking or sitting for a long time not moving enough, eating the wrong food or too much of it, um, not giving yourselves any rest, uh, oxidative stress, toxic overload, not getting enough sleep, being angry, all these negative emotions. And, and these signals also slow down with age. So USANA scientists have been researching these these compounds and using them in their products in the last few years to, to go over and above really what the rest of the market is doing. What, so there, there are very few um, producers of, um, of antioxidants or vitamins and multi, multivitamins that are thinking about the cell signaling that hundred times more powerful um, effects that we can get from cell signaling. So that's setting USANA apart. And in the um, cell essentials, we've got these eight cell signaling micronutrients, which we've talked about. And we, so you can see the core minerals and the Vita antioxidant. You've got the cell signaling ingredients in there. We've also got curcumin in Precosa. And in the health pack, we've got uh, the Cell Essentials Booster, uh, which contains some of the other um, cell signaling nutrients that are not found in the Cell Essentials itself. So what's in the Cell Essentials Booster? Pterocarpus marsupium, olive oil, alpha lipoic acid, and quercetin. And some of the other... Uh, recent products that as USANA has been putting out or launching, um, there are nutrients for brain health. So in, in the most recent product, we've got American ginseng, uh, plus a couple of other cell signaling ingredients, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And in the cell essentials, we've got coenzyme Q10, and green tea extract and resveratrol, all of these 
are very, have been found in research to be really helpful for brain health, as well as omega-3 fatty acids. And a huge proportion of your brain is actually made up of very beneficial fatty acids. So we need to be getting those and cholesterol is very important for brain health as well. And so this is the most recent launch, product launch, Copa Prime, and this contains Bacopa monieri and coffee fruit extract, which are two cell signaling ingredients. And Bacopa monieri um, is a herb that's been used for thousands of years in Ayurvedic medicine, uh, which is a holistic approach to health that's practiced in India. And there are reports and studies that um, uh, in addition to, so it can increase what's called brain derived neurotropic factor, which nourishes and restores the neurons. Um, but in addition to that, Bacopa has been shown to support the production of um, a compound for normal cell signaling, which is key for learning and memory. And it's also an antioxidant and it acts as an adaptogen which is a substance that helps your body to handle the effects of, of stress. And the other cell signaling ingredient in Copa Prime is coffee fruit extract. So the health benefits of coffee go way beyond the beans that we brew. Um, the cherry fruit that those beans come from also offers really valuable nu nutrients when they're harvested and processed in, in certain ways. And the phytonutrient profile of this coffee extract makes it more active in the body. And it's also thought to increase your brain derived neurotropic factor levels, which we spoke about just now. Um, and it offers antioxidant activity for added protection uh, in your brain cells too. So the upshot of all this is that we have to do right by ourselves, by ourselves. We have to give ourselves the nutrients they need, but also the, the right kinds of chemicals that are created by the right kinds of living. So we need to eat smaller portions. We need to fast. Intermittent fasting is great, not for everybody. And you should speak to a nutritional therapist about that um, to see whether it's right for you. Exercise, especially high intensity interval training and weight bearing exercise. We need to eat the rainbow. We need to minimize our carbs. Really, that I can't, if there's one message from here to take home, minimize carbs, minimize sugar for health. Get enough good quality sleep minimize stress so do things that that make you less stressed like meditate and get out into nature if you can um, nurture good relationships nurture your gratitude just think every day about what you're grateful for be kind and also in addition to all that target the cell processes with high quality nutrients and high quality nutrients that have all the backing of the cell signaling research behind them. So not just any old um, combinations of, um, of vitamins and minerals, but real science backed products. So thank you very much for listening.